Hello, my name is Alan Perry and I'm the owner of Positive Convexity. I've been working with various aspects of the technology business for 27 years and for every type of business you can imagine, from small businesses with a handful of employees to large enterprises like the largest banks in the world, government agencies, and massive healthcare conglomerates. Sometimes I worked as an employee and more often I was brought in as an outside expert to help businesses achieve a specific goal or solve a specific problem. I would like to share a story from years back of a customer who called in to help with a migration from one data center to another. The customer needed to move their data center operations from one geographic locale to another due to political instability and the risk of disrupted operations. As this migration involves Citrix ADC and network configuration, these videos will be used to illustrate the do's and don'ts of Citrix ADC network configuration and in some ways network configuration in general. I hope to show some of the strange situations one might encounter with a customer and various ways that these can be dealt with. In order, in order to do this, I have built an environment that matches the customer environment so you can see what I saw when I walked in. Okay, so this is uh, the ADC that we built in the lab. Let's take you through a quick run through of what's uh, set up on there. So your uh, version is different than the one that was used by the customer. I'll show you what VIPs were assigned. So these are the servers. All the IP addresses are 192.168.3.0 slash 24. These are the services that were created from those. You can see lots of different protocols running there. These are the load balance V servers that we created. So these two are not addressable. They're for Netscaler internal use only. This one was created with the link local address also for Netscaler internal use only. And these are the actual uh, web servers, SQL servers, uh, load balanced V servers that uh, actual end users would be getting to. So we'll go down and take a look at the network configuration. You have two interfaces, one's management, one's for data. These are the IP addresses assigned. That's the Netscaler IP, so that's the management IP. This is the subnet IP, which is, uh, I don't know, it's the equivalent of a SVI. And those are the VIPs that we showed when we were looking at load balancing. So have one VLAN attached. Uh, the management will run on an untagged VLAN. As you can see, it's attached to interface 1-2. And has the SNP address assigned to it. Now we'll look at the routing table. So those are uh, built-in routes. That's your default gateway going through 192.168.3.1 which is on the management network.
and here is a bunch of static host routes so why are those there so if you were to walk in cold and look at this configuration and see this routing table what would you think was happening we have a load balancing VIP on VLAN 2 192.168.2.0 slash 24 network. If a user from the public internet hits that VIP, what path does the return traffic take based on the routing table? It's going to follow the default route out of VLAN 3, 192.168.3.0. So the traffic comes in on VLAN 2 and then returns on VLAN 3. If we have a firewall, we're going to have asymmetric routing issues. So you can already see you know, where the problems are in this routing table. So what's going to happen when the ADC changes the source IP address and forwards traffic to the application servers on VLAN 3? What path is that going to take? Well, based on the routing table and all of those static host routes, it's going to follow those static routes out of VLAN 2. So that will get the traffic there, but it's ugly. Nobody in the networking field likes a proliferation of static routes, much less host routes. Okay, so for those of you who are fans of the command line interface, just wanted to uh, show that you can gather all the same information there. So you show server, it'll show you the list of servers. Show server summary. Oh, got a typo. Dash summary. Gives you a list of servers, whether they're enabled or disabled. Show service. And pop that into more because that's a long output. And you can show a summary of uh, the services as well. List of services, ports, protocols. And we got show LBV server. Also long output, so pipe it into more. And we can show a summary of that information as well. Show IP gives you a list of the IP addresses on the Netscaler. Yeah, show VLAN will give us a list of VLANs, the information about it, ports it's attached to, and IPs. And show route, which gives us the routing table that we were looking at before. Okay, so here we got a physical layout slide. It shows the diagram of the physical layout. We got an LACP channel for data traffic in yellow and a one gig copper cable from the management interface to the application server network. Uh, this, this is a physical appliance that uh, the customer had, but we're doing this in a virtual environment. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the only difference would be whether you're using fiber or copper and in a virtualized environment uh, all that's kind of hidden from you so uh, why is the management interface on the application server network why does any of this stuff work at all there are two reasons this traffic flow works mostly as required first the mag based forwarding feature is enabled on the ADC which allows traffic to and from the VIPs to avoid using the layer 3 routing table and return traffic uses the same interface as inbound traffic. With MAG-based forwarding, the ADC keeps track of the physical MAC address of inbound traffic and the interface it was learned from. In this case, all inbound traffic to VIPs will have the source MAC address of the firewall DMZ interface. 
The ADC sends all return traffic at the same interface it was received on to the source MAC address in the table. Second, the use of Layer 3 host routes forces data traffic to application servers to exit via the data interfaces on VLAN 2 instead of following the Layer 3 default route. Without the host routes and the MBF feature, this traffic would fail. What I'm going to do next is take you through this traffic flow step by step so you can see how the traffic flows at each step and when the static routes and the MAC based forwarding come into play. Alright, so here we have our original architecture and we've added in Joe Blow, the user on his laptop with public internet access. That user types in the URL for our web application in their browser resolves the IP address via DNS and sends the first packet out of their interface. That would be a web request. So that request is routed through the infrastructure of the internet until it's sent to our firewall edge interface where most likely the destination IP address is translated to the VIP address on our ADC. Firewall sends modified request out the VLAN 2 interface on the uh, to the DMZ switching infrastructure. The VLAN 2 switching infrastructure sends a request through the LACP channel to the ADC and its VIP address. The ADC VIP address takes the request, performs load balancing algorithms to decide which internal application server, in this case Web 4, to send the traffic to. It also changes the source IP address to its own subnet IP address on the ADC before using the static host routes to determine where to send the request next. It sends the request back out the same interface to the VLAN 2 switching infrastructure on its way to the firewall VLAN 2 interface. The VLAN 2 switching infrastructure sends the traffic to the firewall VLAN 2 interface. The firewall receives a modified request from the ADC, which looks like a brand new request to the firewall checks its firewall rules to see if the traffic is allowed and assuming proper rules are in place it forwards to the outbound interface on VLAN 3. The VLAN 3 switching infrastructure forwards a request to the backend application server Web 4. The request from the user has now reached the app actual application server that will handle the request. Web 4 may do any number of things at this point depending on the details of the request. It could serve up some static content such as an HTML page or images. It could make a request to a database server and format the data returned into HTML and return the results. Uh, it could make its own request to another web application on another web server traversing the load balancing again and then take the response and use it to formulate its own response. Uh, it could do a combination of all of these and more. Uh, we're going to skip that part and go straight to the response, whatever it is. Web 4 will return its response to the Citrix ADC that sourced this request by sending a response back to the ADC SNP via the VLAN 3 switching infrastructure. The VLAN 3 switching infrastructure will forward the traffic to the VLAN 3 interface on the firewall. The firewall will consult its state tables and see that this is a response to a request it already allowed and it will send the response traffic to its VLAN 2 interface. The firewall VLAN 2 interface will send the traffic to the VLAN 2 switching infrastructure destined to the SNP of the ADC. VLAN 2 switching infrastructure will forward the response back to the ADC data interface and the SNP which sent the request. The ADC will check its state and load balancing tables and will see that this is a response to a request made by a specific web user. The ADC will change the source IP address of the response packet from the IP address of Web 4 to the IP address of the VIP that received the initial request and send the traffic back. The ADC will use the MAC based forwarding tables to determine which interface to use for the return traffic and will send the response packet back out the data interface to the VLAN 2 switching infrastructure en route 
to the firewall VLAN 2 interface. The VLAN 2 switching infrastructure will forward the traffic to the firewall VLAN 2 interface. The firewall will again consult its state tables and determine that this is a response to a request it already allowed from an internet user and send the response traffic to its edge interface. The firewall's edge interface will most likely translate the private source IP of the response to a public IP address and will forward the response to the internet. That response is routed through the infrastructure of the internet until it is sent back to our user where their browser will display the response. At some point in the life of this architecture, something's going to break down. Something always breaks down no matter how well you build it. In this case, it wasn't broken down technically, but it needed to be moved because society was breaking down where it was hosted. Either way, at some point, some moderately intelligent, and by moderately intelligent, I mean naively overconfident, person will be asked to get involved. This moderately intelligent person will start looking at this configuration and will most likely be, a one of, be unaware of two things about it. One, while the routing is hideous, it's been working for years now and nothing has been changed recently. And two, that this architecture is held together by the technical equivalent of bubblegum, bailing wire, and duct tape. They'll most likely see the host routes to hosts that are on a directly connected network and either remove or request don't worry, the Change Review Board will dutifully rubber stamp this plan to remove the static routes. This person may have heard the standard and well-founded advice not to use Mac-based forwarding and turn it off. I'm going to show two videos of what happens when you remove the static routes and what happens when you turn off the Mac-based forwarding. So let's uh, remove those static routes, shall we? System, network, routes. Here we got the list of the routes, so we're going to delete all of those static host routes. So one of the things about the ADC is it does not always update in the GUI. Sometimes you have to go back to the same page, refresh, and you'll see now all those routes have been deleted. Now let's go look at the effect on the traffic to the real servers. These, that seven or eight real servers. Now all those show down except for the LDAP service and the reason the LDAP service is still up is because it has a health monitor that runs from the NSIP. If we go look at the results of the health monitor on this service, what you see there is no MIP SNP available to send out the monitor probe. So if we now add a SNP to the management network, I believe all those will come back up. Just go back to system, network, IPs. All right, so let's add a subnet IP on the management network. What we should see is all of the traffic come back up because now we've got a IP to source that traffic from. So go ahead, create the subnet IP, go down here and disable uh, management. You don't want management on that IP. Traffic 
management. And let's look at uh, those servers. Services, excuse me. And they're all back up along with the virtual servers. So the health monitors come up, but now we have our data traffic traversing a one gig management interface and bypassing the firewall for connections to the DMZ to the internal networks. That's not ideal for performance or security reasons. One of the lesser understood things about a Citrix ADC is the management interface and management networks are not isolated from the data networks. There is only one layer three routing table for the whole instance. Now, we can agree or disagree with this design. We can mourn its inclusion or complain bitterly, but it is what it is. So understanding this, I'm gonna show you guys later how this feature can be mitigated. So let's show what happens when we uh, remove the Mac base forwarding feature. What I have here is a uh, Netscaler here. Mac base forwarding is turned on. So I have one window open to the VLAN 2 interface on the firewall and another one to the VLAN 3 interface and we're going to be monitoring that traffic. Alright, so what you see there is when we go to one of the load balance servers, all of the traffic is going to and from the VLAN 2 interface. That's because we still have Mac base forwarding turned on. So let's go over here and let's uncheck Mac base forwarding. Say OK. All right, let's go back and do that same test. Now what you see happening is the traffic arrives on the VLAN 2 interface and then the return traffic tries to go out the VLAN 3 interface where the firewall blocks it because that's not VLAN 3 traffic. And you can see that it just keeps spinning and spinning because it's not completing. And we'll go back, turn MagBase forwarding back on, click OK. And now you saw a piece of traffic immediately go back to layer two, or sorry, VLAN two. And the website stopped spinning in the browser. So that is what MacBase forwarding allows to happen. Well, I hope that this has been at least somewhat illuminating as a description of the problem my customer encountered when trying to move their load balancing between locations. So far, we've only described the problem, but the next video in this series will begin to lay out some possible solutions, and we will go through implementing those solutions one by one. The final video in this series will show one of the best ways to build an environment like this using an ADC and give the do's and don'ts of building a greenfield environment with Citrix ADC. Maybe in another series down the road we can discuss alternatives to traditional load balancers when trying to scale websites. I think it would be fun to compare the, the use of containerization and its built-in load balancers along with stateless web design compared to, to, to traditional load balancing. If you find this interesting and would like to learn more, subscribe to our channel for more instructional videos. If you need help with your organization's technology challenges, please visit our website at positive-convexity.com and get in touch. Thanks for watching.